here for the next presentation uh, is Mr. Austin Lefebvre. Um, Austin is the founder and owner of Aquabox, a company that installs unique aquarium systems worldwide and professionally quarantines and conditions marine fishes. Austin has been in the aquarium industry since 2002, previously working in local fish stores, coral farms, and heading up a fish breeding program. The presentation topic today is bulletproof reef keeping, system design, installation, and maintenance. Oftentimes, hobbyists overlook the maintenance required to keep our systems thriving long term and the appropriate equipment to get them there based on their skill level. Available time commitment and budget. This presentation delves headfirst into having the foresight of what's to come during the design phase, keeping life support systems redundant to prevent catastrophic failure, and how to keep equipment functioning like, like new years down the road. I present Mr. Austin Lefebvre. Thanks, Thank you Thanks very much. All right, hello, MACNA. Thank you all very much for coming. I know it's lunchtime, so I appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'd like to thank Adam Clayton, the entire Bio Reef Keeping crew, and MACNA for putting on such a great show. Uh, would you guys mind giving them a quick round of applause? And having fun? All right. They even sent a car to pick us up from the airport. It was great. Uh, but after all that travel time <clears throat> to get here, they made us share a ride with Pops. Um, so that was a, a little bit disappointing, and uh, you can see Lindsay's face there kind of explains it all. Uh, today we're going to discuss our bulletproof method to reef keeping. This starts with system design and installation and continues on with consistent maintenance, indefinitely. This presentation focuses on hobbyist systems up to 300 gallons or so. For larger systems, we do implement other equipment, uh, maintenance techniques, but overall they're pretty similar. Quick disclaimer. We're not responsible for any damages or loss of life. This, the views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of MACNA, MASNA, or Bayou Reef Keeping. First off, if you don't know me, for as long as I can remember, I've been infatuated with aquatic life. I've been in the industry, as mentioned, for 14 years, fueled by my passion for the ocean. I've worked in retail, wholesale, as a breeder, a writer, and pretty much everything in between, besides commercial collection. Nowadays, I travel to public aquariums around the world to advance my knowledge base. In fact, most of our vacation destinations are chosen based on aquatic things in the area. So huge thanks to my girlfriend, Lindsay, for putting up with me and my shenanigans. I managed to keep her happy with the occasional penguin encounter and fueling her passion for Canis lupus familiaris, AKA dogs, those are our boys. Uh, and I cannot forget about my incredibly supportive side piece. That pink shirt gets me every time. <laughs> So my entire life led to me opening Aquabox. We offer custom aquarium design, installation, consultation, uh, and the big thing we do is turnkey installations. Uh, everything we do is based on scientific evidence with a bit of anecdote mixed in. Our system design and maintenance methods have worked phenomenally for hundreds of aquarists of all different levels around the world. If you have something that works already, make changes slowly or not at all. In this industry at Aquabox, we're firm believers that the customer is not always right. Some people don't like hearing that, but the animals are always right. If we get your animals thriving, the customers are happy. We're not in the business of telling people what they want to hear necessarily. We'll tell them what they need to hear to keep animals thriving. Because long term, we've figured out that if we get your animals super happy and, and thriving and happy, our clients are happy too. As a business, we had to develop a protocol that can be applied to various size systems, clientele involvement, and budgets all while keeping animals thriving. All of our systems are designed to last for decades, not years. Even our classic life support system is seen above. Anyone can come and slap together a system, soft plumb your, your tubing, and, and, and throw an undergravel filter in there with little foresight regarding safety, ease of maintenance, and longevity. We also professionally quarantine and condition fishes. Uh, we've been doing this for our installation clients for years but recently launched Cherry Fish in collaboration with our neighbors at Cherry Corals, making our fishes available to hobbyists nationwide. <clears throat> but enough about me, let's get started. We don't have a minimum system volume or dollar amount to, to work with us or, or consult for you guys, but there are a couple things we like to discuss with every client. And you're gonna hear me say this a lot, but you gotta allow us to keep your animals thriving, not just surviving. We now have the ability to keep reef animals until they perish of old age far longer than they could live in the wild. While aesthetics of equipment and collecting high-end coral can be fun, that should be all of our goals. On a reef, once old age sets in, animals are eaten. It's a fish-eat-fish world out there. Reef fishes do not share the same elderly leisure time afforded to their charismatic megafauna, such as whales and sea turtles. But in aquariums, they can. Most coral does not have a finite lifespan and can continue to grow indefinitely. 
The animals we keep are ambassadors to their wild counterparts that can instill motivation for conservation. And that, my friends, should be the ultimate goal for us as aquarists. Let's get our friends, our family, and the general public motivated to care about the natural aquatic environments. A uh, quick thing on morals again, I, I want to note our actions are being watched by outsiders who want to end the aquarium industry. They use propaganda and alternative facts in an attempt to sway public opinion, which unfortunately we have seen work in the past. This year we almost lost the Hawaiian fishery, which is quite literally one of the best managed fisheries in the world. There was a group that swayed public opinion enough to get a bill passed through the House and Senate. Thankfully, and luckily for us, the governor vetoed this bill on the last day due to the overwhelming amount of scientific data presented showing the Hawaiian fishery is more than just sustainable. Here we see yellow tang numbers up 31% since 1991 in collection areas. The green line there is in collection areas. The blue and red lines above represent off-limit collection areas where we see the population numbers ebb and flow along the same lines as in collection areas. All right, to keep reef animals thriving, stability promotes success. You guys have probably heard this a million times, but it can't be said enough. We have two main sets of parameters we worry about in reef tanks. First on top, we have our coral building parameters, which is generally alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, and our major and minor trace elements. And then on the bottom, we have nutrient levels. Whoops, I skipped one there. On the bottom, we have nutrient levels, namely nitrates, phosphates, AKA algae fuel. And here we see what happens between water changes. Blue line represents water changes. Coral building parameters drop between water changes and nutrients rise. After a water change, we bring the coral building parameters back up and we build nutrients back down. Technically, you could grow coral in a bucket full of quality salt water if providing sufficient flow and light. You'd probably have to do daily 100% water changes to keep your parameters stable, but it could be done. Every other piece of equipment we implement is to keep our water quality pristine between water changes. Take responsibility, damn it. I love this article published in Practical Fish Keeping, a blog out of the UK. In short, it reminds us that we are solely responsible for keeping our animals alive. People love to blame equipment and vendors and everything in between. However, ultimately, it is on us. So since it's on us to keep our animals thriving, we must build a system that does not require constant maintenance, constant tinkering, and constant equipment replacement. That all starts with choosing quality equipment. We have two sides to the equipment world. One is affordable, one is cheap. There are much higher profit margins on cheap equipment, so many stores prefer to sell it. And they'll gladly sell you replacements within a couple years as this cheap equipment fails. Equipment manufacturers see data on how many people leave the hobby after a couple years, so we see some big manufacturers not really caring if their equipment lasts longer than that. Here's a photo of a power cord on your left uh, showing a cheap pump cord eroding in salt water. Now that rubber is plankton in your reef. And on the right, we see a, a, a magnet of a high quality pump that had failed. We see failures like both of these about 50% of the time in cheap equipment within two years. However, it does go to show that even higher quality equipment can have issues and we need to inspect them during maintenance, understand our equipment, understand how to take it apart and put it back together. Keep in mind it's a manufacturer's job to sell you equipment, not necessarily keep your system thriving. R&D in this industry is incredibly lacking overall and oftentimes new equipment is released with the end user, all of you guys being the guinea pig. Aquabox does not sell or install any equipment unless it has been on the market for three years or gone through extensive testing in our office. Occasionally there's some new piece of equipment that we're really, really excited for. We're not gonna wait three years, I'll bring it in and I will literally force it to fail. I'm gonna put it through its paces, I'm gonna see what happens, I'm gonna see how hard we can push it, and then I'm gonna give them feedback. We'll sell it after we've done that process, but overall we don't touch many things until after a couple few years it's been on the market. When it comes to equipment and method choices, longevity and sample size is hugely important. This is why we love collaborating within the industry Drawing knowledge from tenured public aquarists, longtime industry professionals, and expert hobbyists has boosted our sample size exponentially regarding equipment and maintenance uh, methods. Be very careful adhering to anything read online, unless it's found in a sound publication. You can hop on a Facebook group or a forum these days and have people with teeny tiny sample sizes spouting ignorance as fact. It's like watching a bunch of drunk people with Tourette's syndrome around a campfire yelling, ick, fluke, ick as if there's only two ailments that fishes ever encounter. And it can be incredibly frustrating. So all the information you seek is out there. You might have to do some digging, but don't knee jerk into the first answer posted. 
If you're responding online, please take the time to link an article from a reputable source so we can help stop the spread of misinformation. There are three main questions we like to focus on during the planning stages of an aquarium when a client contacts us. Number one, what animals do you have to keep? Why are we talking to you? What's drawing you into this? This is not Pokemon. You do not have to catch them all. Planning around a single animal or a group of animals leads to much better long-term success and really helps us design a system suited for you. Uh, some clients just want something beautiful, and we can work with that. We have kind of some basic groups of animals that we offer. Some clients want a shark tank, <laughs> which, as most of you know, has to be massive system, which leads us to our next question. What's your budget? A budget is very important as it's easy to get carried away in this industry, or hobby, I should say. If you don't budget for, budget for quality equipment, you're gonna have a bad time. And number three, will you perform maintenance or can we locate the filtration remotely? Ease of maintenance overall is what makes or breaks an aquarist long-term. Aquabox has the ability to maintain systems from afar with cameras and quality sensors. And we also hire local on-site support for regular visits if necessary. One of the most common things we hear is buy the biggest tank you can afford. I say figure out the biggest tank you can afford, cut that display size in half. The rest of your equipment will equal or outweigh the cost of your display aquarium if you're doing it right. If I had to pick a, a method we use when it comes to system design, we focus on the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. The more equipment we can eliminate, the less you have to maintain, the less chance of catastrophic failure, and the less expensive it is to set up. During this revamp of a 1,400 gallon system, I replaced 10 water pumps, two air pumps, with two quality water pumps. Imagine what a nightmare it would be to maintain all of those pumps, trace where metal was leaching or stray voltage was leaking, and the high replacement cost over time due to low quality of those pumps. So we focus on an efficient circuit, utilizing every piece of the equipment and the life support system to its full potential. Note we call it a life support system, not filtration alone, since without everything in that circuit functioning properly, life in your display aquarium will cease to exist. Oftentimes we see hobbyists throwing every piece of equipment on a system with zero foresight for the future. This will lead to nightmarish maintenance and much, longer, much larger potential for failures. Now we're gonna look at some equipment that we install to keep our systems thriving. The most important thing all of you guys can do for your reef is get an efficient RODI system with quality filters. Don't get caught up in number of stages or any aesthetic nonsense, none of that matters. You want something simple and affordable to maintain Remember, our only goal here is to produce zero TDS water within a given time frame. That's it. Stages and so forth do not matter, assuming you have quality filters. Remember that every one of your source water is different. Even if you live down the street, your source water is different. So we consult with experts in the water purification field to build a system that is fit to your source water, rather than selling off the shelf units, which inevitably are gonna require more frequent filter replacements. It's no more expensive to do this. The units pretty much look like this. We just put specific filters in there based on the source water test we're pulling from you. The next most important thing is your salt. You want a high quality salt that mixes clean with very consistent parameters. We'll talk more about that later, but that, that's important. Mix it clean, very consistent parameters. Of course, next up, you'll need somewhere to produce your salt water and somewhere to mix, I'm sorry, somewhere to produce your source water and somewhere to mix your salt water. We install reservoirs that allow for a minimum 50% water change in case of an emergency for systems 300 gallons and less. Bigger systems, nah, we can't do that sometimes. So now you can pump directly from your mixing reservoir to your tank rather than juggle buckets, which nobody likes doing and, and I don't blame you. Our favorite style of display aquarium is called a hybrid. Hybrids have glass side panels with PVC bottoms and a one-piece acrylic top. The tops and bottoms are CNC'd for the glass panes to sit securely into. There's a literal channel. This allows silicone to bond on three sides of the glass pane. In our opinion, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a stronger tank than a CNC'd top and bottom hybrid aquarium. If you're looking at glass tanks, you might get in the age old debate of Starfire versus regular glass. We always lean towards regular glass. It's more affordable and does not scratch as easy. Starfire is great, but we're seeing a lot of marketing hype behind it these days. I've never seen an amazing reef tank and walked up to it and go, that's not Starfire, Ugh, never mind. You know, it, it, an amazing reef tank's an amazing reef tank, whether it's Starfire or not. So you can save quite a bit of money by going with regular glass. Whatever display aquarium route you take, pay close attention to the thickness of materials. When you see a cheap tank, it's built of th thin materials. 
We frequently find things overlooked by mass aquarium manuf manufacturers like tiny one inch drain holes in a 300 gallon reef ready aquarium. It's crazy. We also see a lot of overflows not covered or not ran to the top rim of the tank. Unfortunately, my friend MetroCat experienced this with her beautiful rhomboid wrasse. This great aquarist had a custom top on her system which kept the wrasse in when it jumped, but it trapped them on top of the overflow because some manufacturers don't think about that height there. We believe every fish keeping aquarist should have a top on their tank to prevent jumping, even in a rimless aquarium. There are some beautiful screen tops on the market nowadays that won't detract from overall aesthetics, like this one from Artfully Acrylic on our office reef. Most fishes will jump at some point, it's inevitable. I have had a 16 inch lionfish come leaping out of a tank at me when I was 17 years old. It scarred me for life, but most all fishes will jump. If you don't want a top, you can keep seahorses, you can keep cuttlefish, every other fish will jump. <clears throat> so give, us, give them a seat belt, put a top on your tank. Next up after the display tank is a sump. When in doubt, stick to the kiss method. These days we see people adding baffles just to add baffles, just to come up with something new and improved, different colors and more baffles. Our entry level systems utilize acrylic sumps, which is a better insulator than glass. And if you drop a pump or accidentally kick your sump, you won't be calling me in the middle of the night for an emergency visit. Our next step up is polyvinyl chloride or PVC sumps. They're the most efficient insulators and can be customized to fit everything you can imagine, including UV. They're also darn near indestructible, as witnessed here, where a massive sump is being lifted by its baffles. That's pretty incredible. You try that with any other sump, those baffles are gonna get ripped out. Prefilters are a fantastic addition to your sump as they catch food and waste prior to settling or breaking down. Filter socks are probably the most common nowadays. Uh, and they're available in various microns, materials, and so forth. And if you have questions about specifics, you can ask me later. We're seeing roller fleece filters coming in the mainstream nowadays. I have a very small sample size with this. My only experience is they smell terrible. Excess food and waste collects in these things and rots until you change that. I did see one downstairs today that was pretty wicked and it has an area that seems to be fairly contained. So they're improving on these things. Uh, we also see a fair amount of waste sneaking around the three or four we've worked on, right around, which wouldn't happen with a filter sock. And of course there's moving parts in these and sensors, which are gonna require maintenance and inevitably they will fail over time. So it's moving us away from the KISS method. We like filter socks, filter socks don't fail. Protein skimmer is the digestive tract of our life support systems. They remove excess food, waste, and other organic compounds prior to breaking down into algae fuel. The pump is the heart of any protein skimmer. A good body with a crap pump is useless. So spend a little extra here and get something that's easy to maintain long-term, something you won't have to tinker with all the time. Once your skimmer breaks in, you should be able to set it and kind of forget about it besides cleaning. In a reef system, an auto top-off is a crucial piece of equipment that will keep your salinity stable. Without keeping your salinity stable, don't even worry about all your other parameters. We've got to keep salinity stable first before we worry about everything else. I highly recommend not connecting your RODI to your sump with a float valve, as I've seen dozens of devastating failures over the years, including major damage to homes and reef tanks turning freshwater. If you, can't, if you connect your RODI unit directly to an ATO reservoir, put a valve on the feed line so you can turn it off, so it'll, uh, it protects from TDS creep in your RO membrane. Don't cheap out on your auto top off unit itself. Or you'll come home to a flooded floor and a freshwater tank. We've seen a ton of those fail as well. This is our go-to, the Tunzi Osmolator. It's pretty much the only one we use. It's triple redundant. And if you put a float valve on your feed, it's now quadruple redundant. We're really, really hard pressed to have these things fail. The only thing we see failing is the feed pump, which just gets old. They're about $25 for a new one, no worries. Return pumps move our filtered water back up to our display tank. Some people get way too caught up in sump turnover numbers and archaic published information in that field. The most important thing to avoid with your return pump or your, your filtration circuit and your sump is short circuiting the system by sending too much water past your skimmer or vice versa, letting it dwell too long. So generally we're matching our return flow going in the tank to the water output coming from your skimmer. It's a great start. In-tank flow is still the most underrated thing in the hobby. There's two types of flow we're concerned with. Laminar flow and alternating flow. Alternating flow is incredibly important as it allows corals to shed mucus more easily. And it brings them uh, oxygen and, and, and other nutrients very fast, where laminar flow doesn't, doesn't have the same effect there. I wanna see a piece of food hit your substrate or bare bottom, skip across the bottom, and be pulled back up into the water column. Want to see that cycle continue until it works its way into an overflow or a fish's mouth. I don't want to see anything settling. We will never replicate the flow our animals experience in the ocean, 
ever. So do not be afraid to crank these things up real, real high. Literally until you're pinning a fish to the glass, you can crank them up. You pin a fish to the glass and a little clown fish going, oh my God, you know, maybe turn it down a little bit. But up until that point, you're good. The most heavily debated topic in our hobby, for no reason, is lighting. You can truly get away with any quality light source, assuming you're providing the appropriate spectrum. T5s are still probably my favorite if I had to choose one. They provide an incredibly even spread, even as corals grow and begin to shade one another out. We're covering the whole tank with them. LEDs are probably the most common nowadays with a plethora to choose from, and these are great lights. However, many people are finding that the power savings aren't necessarily great to begin with, especially in a climate like where I'm from in Michigan, where we're running our heaters eight months out of the year. With that said, I love strapping some LED blues onto a T5 fixture for that extra pop. I used to not like the blue pop, now I'm just a, a sucker for it. <clears throat> Metal halides were once king and are starting to make a comeback in some areas. Overall, they do provide the best usable spectrum for coral growth compared to other lighting sources, but you do have to deal with the higher heat output. If you ask any of the best coral farmers, in my world anyways, Terry Corals Worldwide and Jason Fox, they'll tell you that stable water parameters and flow are more important than putting God's flashlight over your tank. Probably the most misconstrued and incorrectly installed piece of equipment in an, is an ultraviolet sterilizer. We're very, very big on UV at Aquabox. When properly applied, it not only clarifies your water column, but also controls parasite and bacteria outbreaks on our beloved fishes. And less commonly noted, it does the same for coral. We mostly hear about it for fishes since a lot of our scientific data regarding UV is pulled from mass aquaculture farms for human grade meat. There's a ton of research money in that field. There's next to nothing in research for coral aquaculture and UV. I think we're gonna be seeing some more on it someday, but right now it's tough to find. I can tell you 100% anecdotally, it works. There are many misconceptions regarding the use of UV, which I feel is mostly due to the onslaught of inadequate units being pushed into the hobby. About 90% of them out there uh, might clarify your water a little bit, but they're useless for anything else. If a manufacturer cannot provide fluence rates or UV dose, run for the hills. They don't understand what they're selling and it's a repackaged product. Sometimes we hear people say, but they kill good things too, Austin. And I say, what good things do they kill? Generally, the answer is copepods, but I've never seen a pod look too good after being sucked through your return pump, blown around your plumbing, and shot into your tank. Any pod that fires out of your return outlet simply makes a fish's dream come true as they snatch them up like a nice morsel. Most of our systems are not really big enough for any real plankton production, so I stand strong that UV is in infinitely more valuable than detrimental when applied appropriately. If you're not gonna apply it appropriately, don't do it, and it is not a necessity. So don't think you have to have them, but they do work really well when applied appropriately. In 2014, I wrote an article for reefs.com titled Winter is Coming regarding aquarium heaters. Clearly Game of Thrones was in season. I found it fitting since heaters are the most evil piece of equipment that some of us are forced to use. We have several material options for submersible heaters with internal or external thermostats commonly offered. On the left, that is a Eheim Jaeger internal thermostat. On the right, that's some titanium probe, which requires an external temp probe. That is still, both of those are still single redundant. One stage of redundancy. Any route you take, your heating system should be redundant. You want more than one stage of redundancy. Using two undersized heaters with internal thermostats that equate to your total necessary wattage provides two stages of redundancy. So if we need 300 watts of heat, use two 150s. That way if one sticks on, you're not gonna cook your tank and you can catch it. Adding an external controller with its own temperature probe can be added for a third stage of redundancy. This is the most common system we install. Note that these controllers use high quality titanium temperature probes, which are meant for our usable range. Most all-in-one controllers rely on subpar temperature probes that call for calibration at zero degrees Celsius or freezing, which is well out of our usable range. If we're calibrating way down here and we want up at 76, 78, those things are skewed. And I've had a lot of issues with reliability out of temp probes from all-in-one controllers. These are real. Note the red arrow here showing a third-party temperature control device. Also note the age of this picture, proving that they have withstood the test of time. Back when Julian had hair and Jay had no, Joe had no grace. They've been around a long time. You can get in a couple failures with a temperature controller, but if you have triple redundancy, it's not anything to worry about. Then we have superb inline heaters for large aquariums, but they start at about 1,000 watts, clearly not so suitable for most hobbyists. I'll kiss the first manufacturer on the lips who comes out with a quality submersible heater for smaller systems comparable to one of these. 
Chillers are not something we often talk about these days due to the demise of metal halides, but should you find yourself in need of one, the same redundancy principles apply. This is a giant chiller for a penguin pool in New York. Turns out the penguins don't like the cold water, much to the dismay of the aquarium curator. So apparently the flightless birds became footballs. Now we have temperament control, not temperature control. Media reactors can be implemented to house all different types of media, namely chemical medias that help remove nutrients after they break down. Granular ferric oxide, or GFO, is an excellent phosphate magnet. Carbon polishes the water column, reduces odors, removes yellowing compounds, and removes organics that build up over time. Media reactors are also a phenomenal way of adding additional biological filtration in an incredibly small footprint. We can adequately filter a 400 gallon reef system using a six inch by 20 inch reactor filled with proper biomedia. To keep our coraling, coral building parameters stable between water changes, we generally utilize dosing pumps using a high quality two part on systems of the volume we're discussing today, 300 gallons and lower. Note high quality two part also contains major and minor trace elements. Most dosing pumps are easy to operate and calibrate. Redundancy in case of failure is important here, so a pH probe tied to a power for the pump would shut them off since pH spikes when too much two-part goes into a system. Calcium reactors are still used by many reefers, and they're a great alternative to two-part. If you're familiar with calcium reactors, you like calcium reactors, use a calcium reactor. However, oftentimes Kelquaster needs to be added to buffer pH back up. They can be a little tough to dial in for new Aquarists, and they do have a higher upfront cost. All of this leads to a more difficult system for us to maintain remotely, so if we're getting a new aquarist into the industry, into the hobby, I'm sorry, we're, we're generally going with dosing pumps, 300 gallons and smaller, 300 gallons and larger, we're gonna take you to a calcium reactor real quick. This is, this is our favorite kind right here. Rock choices have never been more far stretching than they are today. Do your research when choosing your rock source or consult with someone like me who has done that research, as quality of any of these choices varies from phenomenal to you couldn't pay me to put that in my tank. Less than desirable compounds can and will leach out of many of these options today, depending on their source or manufacturing process. Know your rock. Main thing to consider when picking your sand is particle size. Generally, somewhere in the middle works for most people. We tend to stick with a little bit larger grain so it stays put under high flow. We always use dry sand. Live sand's a great premise, but all living things require oxygen. There's not much oxygen in a sealed bag, and we don't want all anaerobic bacteria coming out of those sealed bags. <clears throat> Quick notes on Aquascape, do not dwell on the rock structure. We see a lot of Aquarius having fun, getting into it, and standing there for three, four weeks stacking your rocks. Rather, consider what kind of coral you plan on growing. So we plan a coralscape, not an Aquascape. Here's our office aquarium on day one. A third structure from a pre-existing tank was dropped in the center, and over time we created this. I put like 10 minutes into the rock structure mindset. I put weeks into what corals are we growing and where. Some of you are probably thinking, what about controllers? This is my trusted controller. It never fails, it cannot be beat, and there's no firmware updates. I'm probably one of the most hardcore Aquarists you'll find who's not a controller fanboy yet. After dozens, or everything currently on the market can have some major issues, which have to be rectified with the manufacturer. After dozens of several hour long calls when a client's controller would brick, we began moving away from allowing them to control all of our equipment, However, we still use them frequently to monitor everything. Nowadays, most of us walk around with literal computers in our pockets, which many children can run. Aquarium controller companies would love you to think their units are just as simple, even though they operate on antiquated systems comparable to MS-DOS. But fear not, we know of several really great companies working on bringing aquarium controllers to the present day. However, we have to install uh, or incorporate redundancy and peace of mind. So we love these Milwaukee black box controllers for redundancy of our coral building parameter equipment. This will shut off your calcium reactors, shut off your dosing pumps, should your pH spike or drop. Save your reef. And the added bonus is that they cost about half of what a lot of the all-in-one controllers cost. For peace of mind, we use Nest cameras. They give real-time view of the inhabitants, which is infinitely more valuable to me than some random ORP level. And they have a built-in power outage alert. Nest cameras specifically have this built-in power outage alert. I've tried a lot of different cameras and none of them seem to have a reliable power outage alert. Although they offer no redundancy, switchable power strips are an easy way to quickly turn equipment on and off if you're looking for something super affordable and you don't need to unplug things with wet hands. Some of you are also probably wondering, what about algae? Algae is an, it can be an incredibly efficient means of removing nutrients once they break down, especially provided the proper light spectrum and intensity. One thing not talked about a lot is a, a really efficient refugium also requires a specific amount of flow. We don't have time for that today, but we prefer moving things prior to breaking down 
and utilizing chemical media for those that have broken down. The downfall we've faced with most algae growing systems is that with the proper maintenance we're going to discuss here in a minute and the equipment we've already discussed, the algae crashes. When algae crashes, they release all kinds of nutrients in the water column, and they do release some species release undesirable compounds as they grow. So on a large sample size with 300 gallon systems and less, using our method, algae refugiums kind of overcomplicate the system, so we're avoiding them. We use them a lot on fish-only systems where we're not too worried about other trace elements, and we use them a lot on much bigger systems as well. I'm not sure where it started, but many people seem to dread water changes. Why? If you're mixing up low quality salt in five gallon buckets for your 300 gallon reef, I can understand. It's a pain in the butt. I've seen people do it, it's gonna burn you out. But that's where our water mixing stations we discussed come into play. So make the water changes easy on yourself. Don't forget to clean your sand beds. They have to be clean for long-term success. Sometimes we see the small sample size people saying, oh, I never clean my sand beds, so on and so forth. Talk to me in two to four years. You're gonna have some issues. Clean your sand beds. Python hoses allow you to do water changes right down your sink drain, forgetting all about juggling five gallon buckets. You can use an adapter on a Python to uh, connect to a pump in your saltwater mixing station and refill your display with the same hose. So you've got one hose, drain your tank, fill it back up, carry on with your life. Make it easy on yourself. This system has PVC tubing ran through the wall for fresh salt water, RODI water, and a wastewater pump in the sump, if you want to drain a sump real quick. Gravel cleaning on this system is still done with a hose into a bucket or a Python. This system has the same aforementioned plumbing ran to the sump downstairs. Note that red arrow. But upstairs, we ran another line so the client can gravel vac directly into his main home drain. Now he's not getting yelled at by his wife for dragging a Python hose around his home. Spousal or partner approval is hugely important in this hobby. Here I should mention that some methods these days are trying to get completely away from water changes. There are some great things coming from these methods. However, they have proved to be more costly over time. We use ICP testing all the time to, to, to get a quick look at, at clients' tanks. Um, we can talk about ICP later if you really want to on the side. Uh, th these systems rely on consistent expense of testing and they can be incredibly difficult to troubleshoot unless you're quite experienced. I've had dozens of clients send me their ICP results saying, I'm not a chemist, what the hell does this mean? And oftentimes these systems recommend water changes to fix parameters once they're out of whack. So back to square one we go. Furthermore, these no water change methods require specific trace element addition consistently, and as of today, there is no way to ensure redundancy since there's no probes that measure these elements. So if a dosing pump fails on, you're in for spike parameters, which can only be fixed by water changes. So I really like these systems, I think they're awesome, but on our, on our sample size and getting new people into the industry, the water changes are where it's at. So we target your reef parameters based on what your salt mixes to. If your salt mixes to 8 dKH, run your reef at 8 dKH. If your salt mixes at 10 dKH, run your reef at 10 dKH. Doing this allows you to perform large water changes without any worries. Now you've slammed your nutrients. You've raised your coral building parameters quickly and efficiently. In heavily stocked reef system, we're doing a minimum of 30% water changes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly depending on bio load. Some people cringe at these percentages due to salt costs. However, you will spend considerably more time tinkering with things, trying other methods, buying additional equipment that you don't need when you could accomplish your end goal with using the above percentages and be pulling overgrown coral out of your tank before you know it. Using this method allows you your reef to thrive and you can get back to enjoying your reef tank and everything else you enjoy in your life. Keep up with your RODI maintenance. Don't let TDS creep up more than one part per million. Most hobbyists should only have to replace filters once per year, maybe a couple DI replacements, if you're utilizing a system built for your source water. This is <clears throat> Make sure to flush your new RODI filters prior to use with downstream filters removed. This is what comes out of a new carbon block. This is actually the a really high quality carbon block we use in our office, but they all have uh, particulate in them. So if you put them directly into use, this is all going right to your RO membrane. It's gonna clog them up fail prematurely. Clean your pre-filters regularly or avoid them entirely. If they're allowed to collect tons of detritus and waste, they're doing more harm than good. When you're first getting into reefing, test your parameters frequently. Pay attention to trends more than the actual number. Testing once every few weeks yields borderline useless results. We need to know what's going on in between. We need to watch for that trend. Clean your skimmer cup regularly. 
The cleaner it is, the better it performs. Leaving gunk built up in a skimmer neck reduces performance considerably. Automatic net cleaners seem like a great investment. However, it's something that can fail and will require maintenance. We've also seen a lot of them just kind of push the skimmer around, not really do any cleaning. Side note, this is a nine-year-old skimmer with an original AC pump. It fills this cup like this a couple times per week. That top is literally blown off due to skim it, proving to me that this pump is an absolute workhorse. So when you're going to choose equipment, it doesn't have to be new, cool, and fun, and fun colors. You want something that's tried and true that you're not gonna have to work on all the time. Exchange chemical media is at regular intervals, generally monthly. Just like pre-filters, detritus can get caught in your media, and of course, they lose effectiveness over time. If you're running UV, make sure to clean the quartz sleeve quarterly, at least. A dirty, a dirty quartz sleeve makes UV useless. Stay on top of bulb changes, too. Contrary to manufacturer claims, we've seen high-pressure bulbs shift within six months. Low-pressure bulbs have proven to be much more stable over time, actually getting us closer to the 10 to 12 month, 12, 10 to 12 month range. If you're relying on probes to control equipment, they should be recalibrated every 30 days, and you should be replacing them every six months. If you're using lab-grade probes, you can recalibrate every 60 days, replace them once a year. If you're using your probes to monitor levels, this is a little bit less important. Just know that your readings will skew over time. Clean all your equipment every three to six months. Inspect for damage, rust, wear and tear. It's really important to know your equipment, know how to take it apart, know how to put it back together. Remove detritus from your sump several times per year. Python with a gravel vac remove works great, but my go-to is still a shop vac. Change bulbs at regular intervals, which is generally every nine to 12 months. If running LEDs, keep track of running time. <clears throat> Even if the bulb or diode is still lit, spectrum does shift over time, resulting in less usable light for coral growth, but LG will love it. Don't suffer from LARS. This is a term coined by my friend Joe. Lazy ass reefer syndrome. There's this heater I pulled out of a, a rebuild we were doing and I showed the client like, are, are you kidding me? You know, so, so internal heaters have a thermostat in there. What do you think I was measuring? We have even seen LARS lead to dangerous situations, which is our next topic, safety. These certification, certifications exist for a reason, to ensure products are safe. Last year we were involved in several aquarium rebuilds due to fires and floods. This is no joke, guys. That's an aquarium in the middle there, it was an aquarium. Salt water and electricity do not mix. For the sake of your family, your home, and the animals we keep, don't take unnecessary chances. Don't buy super all cheap equipment. Make sure you're using drip loops and so forth. Safety doesn't have to be fancy, just effective. This is my friend's breeding system. She has drip loops in place and outlets way out of harm's way should splashing occur. Of course, you can be very fancy when it comes to electrical organization. Here's my friend Richard of Aficionados Power Center. But make sure everything is easily accessible for maintenance and troubleshooting. I've had to cut out a fair amount of wires over, the, over time when people don't you know, realize that and they're wrapping stuff around other cords. And also note that you can get RF, radio frequency interference, when you're running too many wires close together and they're gonna give you false readings in your probes. Just be careful with that. Be prepared for power outages. Battery backups are great for short-term protection. They allow us ample time to get to our aquarium and get a generator running. Of course, you need to have an alert for when power goes out. That's where our camera or our controller comes into play. Make sure to test these batteries regular, regularly and replace them as necessary. They are a battery, they do go bad. We cycle them out every two years. Gas generators can be had in all sizes and they can even be rented if necessary. Just know that in about 15 minutes in a big power outage, your local rental place will be out of generators. So get on good terms with them if you're not gonna purchase one. Get something that can handle the load of all the pumps and the temperature control. Lights can be left off for about three days with no effect to coral, and then you can cycle them on and off down line if necessary if you're in an unfortunate longer power outage than that. On that same note, we highly recommend keeping spare parts on hand for crucial equipment, namely flow and return pumps. You don't wanna rush around like a chicken with your head cut off when your animals are dying because you don't have a spare pump. Staying within a reasonable tank size from the beginning allows us to afford a spare or two. Remember that we are solely responsible for the lives of these animals. Saying, oh well, during a power outage or equipment failure is not an acceptable answer. If that's your answer, get a flat screen TV and, and loop reef videos. Doesn't matter if uh, your power goes out, you don't have to worry about it or collect on coins or stamps or something. They don't die during a power outage. All right, so now we're gonna take a little bit closer look at uh, some of the systems we've designed using everything we've just covered here. We're gonna look at systems of all different sizes, but mostly the size range we've discussed today. 
So first, we've been maintaining this reef for about eight years now with minimal equipment. It's got a redundant heating system, return pump, in-tank flow, in-tank flow backup, skimmer. Coral's not going to blow any collectors away, but this system is thriving, with the majority of fishes being over a decade old. There's several fish in here that are 14 years old. I think my youngest fish in this system is six years old. The system is seen by dozens of people a week in Southeast Michigan, bringing this fragile ecosystem to the forefront of their mind, hopefully inspiring them to care about our natural aquatic habitats. You're probably sick of seeing this picture by now, but this is our main office reef. Our reef is undergoing a life support system upgrade right now, which I had hoped to have done by MACNA, uh, but we've been incredibly busy, thankfully, and clients come first. We'll be opening a showroom to prospective clients this year, so I wanted additional saltwater displays in our office. However, more reef tanks didn't really capture the breadth of our projects, so last year about this time, I started designing our two new, two new saltwater displays. I've always been optimistically curious of Nidarians, even when they wrap around my face while climbing up a dive boat ladder like this one tried to. And no, I don't let anyone pee on my face when that happens. And it has happened many times. Lindsay has always been a fan of uh, jellyfish exhibits uh, at public aquariums. And as many of you know, spousal or partner approval is crucial. And here you can see a little pilot fish swimming in the Aurelia arita, uh, or moon jellyfish. Mangrove habitats have always intrigued me, and decades ago after seeing one of Julian's inspiring mangrove displays, I told myself, Austin, one day you're gonna have a mangrove tank. These fascinating habitats are completely underappreciated, yet yield tremendous amount of life. They provide safe haven for young animals, and they're the reason many islands are able to withstand hurricanes. Unfortunately, mangrove deforestation is happening in mind-boggling numbers nowadays, so I feel it's important to bring more awareness to these wonderful ecosystems that literally allow reefs to exist. Neither of these systems you're about to see have been shared with the general public. Uh, we've been saving them to share with you guys here today. I took both of these videos off Isla Mirada after Macna in Miami. My brother was a dive uh, master down there and we had a ton of fun for like a week. First is our moon jellyfish display. I was not happy with any of the off the shelf offerings due to subpar filtration. We feed our animals very heavy and we design life support systems for a living. So I wanted a system that I could design to a real life support system. Our other new reef display is a mangrove exhibit. I finally have the aquarium I've been dreaming of for a decade. Big shout out and thanks to Julian for helping me bring this to fruition. Can't thank you enough, Julian. I went back and forth regarding other animals to keep with this mangrove, but thought, what's better than one Nidarian exhibit? Oh crap, I skipped it. What's better than one Nidarian exhibit? Two Nidarian exhibits. The mangrove shares this tank with Cassiopeia andromeda, aka upside down, upside down jellyfish. We have one species of red macro algae currently and plan to add some more variety down the line. These guys are super cool critters. They kind of just do this all day. They're photosynthetic and uh, we actually have gotten them to eat some mice and other much smaller things. They just kind of eat everything, they're super cool. In order to keep maintenance low, I opted to link the two displays together, sharing one life support system on top of a fancy new stand. We don't have much for fancy stands in the office, so I wanted to get something. I'm currently enjoying this system more than our reef. It's just a lot of fun. Um, we've got those lights with proper spectrum LED bulbs in there, and uh, it just kind of kicks butt. It's awesome. The life support system was built specifically for optimal Nidarian health, which includes chemical media, additional biological filtration, and an ultraviolet sterilizer. Of course, an auto top-off was added to keep salinity stable. We installed this system earlier this year for a longtime client. There's been a few pictures of the system in this talk. His only stipulation was that the new display aquarium keep the same footprint, length and width, as the old aquarium. Remember, partner approval was crucial. But we, we just have to make the new display, new display larger, right? Who, who builds a new aquarium and doesn't go bigger? Um, so we went taller. Kept the same footprint, but we went taller. This picture is deceiving, but the display is a 150 gallon tank. Past his only stipulation, he said, Austin, build me what you would build for yourself. I said, client, are you sure about that? He said yes. I said cool. Personally, I despise seeing powerheads and cords in an aquarium. They're really detract, distracting. Self uh, subconsciously, we're drawn to those things. We don't realize it, but we are. So we went with closed loops for in-tank flow. The three pipes in the center are drains and a return from the sump downstairs. And we already talked about that fourth pipe. In the filter room, we have a frag tank for incoming coral and fishes linked to the system. Everything passes through a superb UV sterilizer prior to heading back upstairs. Our fluence rate in this sump is gonna nuke anything and everything that goes through there. We had minimal space for a saltwater mixing station, but we really can make anything work. 
With this water station and sump design, our client can do a 40% water change by flicking a couple of valves in under 10 minutes. Now that's not, it should be noted, that's not a standard water change, but should he get really busy, get behind on maintenance, or have an emergency, he can do that with turning a couple of valves, not getting his hand wet, hands wet. We saw some really interesting comments on Facebook when Ecotech shared this build a while back. I'm not here to pick on these comments. Uh, they actually raised a couple of pretty good questions that I wanted to address briefly. The first one, why would you make a 10,000 gallon side filtration room for a 60 gallon cube? I literally laughed out loud at this. It was, it was a good comment. I can assure you filtration for 10,000 gallon tanks we work on looks significantly different than this. After adding animals, both coral and fishes, and running full reef lighting on the upstairs display and the frag tank downstairs, for seven months, we are yet to see a speck of algae in this system. Not on the rocks, not on the glass, nowhere. The client cleans a light bacterial film off the glass upstairs every two weeks. That's it. So this is why we install filtration like this, for ease of maintenance, long-term success. Next comment, somebody made a bunch of money off that guy. <laughs> that, was, that was great. Well, thankfully, I, I do make a living doing this, kind of, sometimes. By no means am I rich. I've averaged over 90 hours of work per week this year, and I still drive an early 2000s Jeep Liberty and live modestly with my family. These days, many of our projects are under an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, we respect our clients' privacy 100%. But we did get permission to share some of this amazing 2,500 gallon project we have in progress in collaboration with MRC. This client had been put through the ringer by another company after his newly installed aquarium failed, leaked, flooded his entire home. He had to have flooring, walls, you name it, everything got replaced. After that incident, the client knew it was time to call in the professionals. This was the disaster we walked in on. There's much more to large life support systems than simply scaling up equipment. You cannot use equipment just bigger and think that it's gonna work for a large system like this. The aquarium infiltration room for this project are located in a basement. The approach to this client's sliding basement door from the driveway was incredibly steep. The driveway was up here on the main level of his home, the basement was down here. There was a really steep hill there. So the movers we contracted decided the safest route to get everything in was via a crane with an 80-foot boom. One of the more stressful times of our lives was watching this custom equipment being lifted up and over the client's home. Me and my uh, partner in crime, you'll see here in a minute, uh, we're sitting there just sweating profusely. You know, this stuff got shipped across the country and uh, it's, it's a, I don't know, 80 feet in the air. The lift up was slow and calculated. Once over the house, the professionals dropped this equipment like a brick with incredible precision. It was terrifyingly amazing. Life support was designed to be as large as possible while still being able to fit everything into the filtration room. Kind of. Things got a little bit tight, but we do come prepared for anything. A little pop the door frame off, sump one in. No problem. <laughs> Life support system speaks for itself. That's a six foot tall industrial skimmer behind Marvin, my partner in crime for this project. To give you another size of scale, I was able to disappear inside the sump for a couple of hours during some of this installation and to take a nap. This client could literally, quite literally, poop in his reef, and the parameters would remain rock solid. This life support system is designed to support over 150 pounds of animals. Not talking numbers of animals, talking pounds of animals. It's actually 100 pounds modestly. We're gonna stock it heavy. It's gonna get a lot of work out, and uh, it's gonna handle it. Adjacent to the life support system sits a dedicated quarantine system. This rack also holds uh, some equipment for the main reef. You can spot a calcium reactor on there, Kelquester and so forth. And those are, that's a top off reservoir on the very top of that rack, a uh, top off for both the main reef and for the separate quarantine system. Prior to leaving any job site, we have to ensure the appropriate vibes can be felt. This is just as important for system longevity as anything. We'll be back this fall to install this display aquarium, so be sure to stay tuned on social media to watch the rest of this amazing system come to fruition. It's gonna be super freaking cool. I'm always happy to answer quick questions from any Aquarius via email. You wanna know about a pump, skimmer, anything, this is what I do, this is all I do. I don't know sports, I don't know pop culture, I know fish, that's it. But please know that sometimes quick questions turn into more questions, which becomes a consultation So because we do this for a living. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Instagram, at Aquabox Aquariums, and we are now a sponsor of the world's largest reef forum, Reef to Reef. So we have our own forum on there now too. 
Over the years, I've drawn inspiration from incredible aquarists throughout the globe. I cannot thank these individuals enough for their passion they put in our industry to consistently improve animal welfare. You guys are freaking awesome. You are the, the light. Special shout out to my best friends whom I would not be here without, Todd and Brett of Cherry Corals. And very special thanks to the love of my life, Lindsay. Cannot thank you guys enough for coming today. I will be speaking again on Sunday afternoon regarding keeping benthic feeders, namely angels and butterflies, with coral. So if that interests you, I hope to see you there.